Hey everybody, welcome to the Food Conspiracy, how you can take back control over your health and prolong your life. My name is Ben Hunt. I've been fascinated my whole life about how we can be happy and healthy human beings walking free upon the earth. With me is Phil Escott. Hi, Phil. Hi, Ben, and hello, everybody. Yes, my name is Phil Escott, and I had to throw out everything I thought I knew after writing books and all sorts on on plant-based eating, and I had to throw out everything I thought I knew to wake up to this, the war on meat, which is happening now, and the war on all of our food, really. And if you've woken up to other stuff, please bear with us for these 60 minutes. You're going to learn an awful lot that might really change your life, might really help to save your life. And we'll have details on how to look much deeper into all of this on our big fat challenge that we run together. There'll be links below. Fantastic. So what we're talking about is this this food conspiracy. Like, like Phil says, you probably haven't got a clue that this is going on, but it's been going on for an awful long time since the end of the last ice age, since we transitioned from being hunter-gatherers into agriculturalists. And we that really, it was the, the start of human civilization with things like land ownership, wealth, um, writing, money, all this kind of thing. But w- along with that came something kind of far darker and more insidious, which is that some human beings decided that they... Uh, they they had the right to rule over and to dominate other human beings, which is really something that had never happened before. And uh, we are experiencing that now. It's been going on for maybe up to 10,000 years since the invention of agriculture. But really now we are entering what is clearly the end game because it has really ramped up over time. Every empire that was ever built on agriculture came to an end between like 500 and 1,000 years, except for the ancient Egyptians, and we're going to talk a bit more about them later. Uh, and what we are really seeing now is the the final death throes of maybe the last great human empire, uh, which you can see being played out all around you. There, there are so many people who are awake to the money and banking scam, the pharmaceutical scam, government, science, COVID, whatever you like, climate education, but are still in in the grip of the food conspiracy. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Please give us your attention. We do really appreciate your time. And the other thing that we, we want to ask you to do is just leave your preconceptions at the door. You're welcome to pick them back up again on the way out. We know that a lot of what we're about to tell you is going to be challenging. It, it will confront some of maybe your even longest held beliefs about food and about health. And we're not going to apologize for that. But at the same time, Phil, we we don't want to ask anyone to believe anything that we're about to tell you either. Go and go and research it for yourself. The information is all out there. It's always been out there, but you will understand why it's been hard to find as, as we, we move through. Okay. So let's, let's just dive in. What we're talking about, uh, the highest level is a kind of degeneration of humanity. If you think about three main eras of human existence, first, we've got the prehistoric period. So before about 10,000 years ago, 99% of human existence on, on Earth, where we were basically hunters and gatherers, we got most of our energy from animal fats and about 10% of it from maybe from carbs. The second period is the agricultural era, what we talk about as basically the whole of human history as we know it, where we totally switched over those macronutrient profile and we started getting the majority of our energy from carbs, from plants, from the land instead of from fat. And then finally, we come up to the industrial age, really the last couple of hundred years only, and our food has changed even more dramatically again, and so has our our health and our, our vitality as a human race. Looking back just over the last few years, the uh, the COVID so-called pandemic brought the whole world to a standstill, caused families to split and businesses to go under, and yet kind of turned out to be nothing really out of the ordinary, but there is a far far more 
damaging pandemic that is going on all around us right now that no one is really talking about. Now, one sign of this could be, are you carrying those extra pounds around your middle, right? This is a sign of what you might call metabolic syndrome. It's not the it's not the only symptom, it's just one symptom, but this really is kind of at the at the the center of the collapse in human health, the collapse in human uh, power and vitality that we are witnessing all around the world right now. So yeah, Ben, yeah, I think you know it's really important to point out that you know in that whole COVID thing that I'm sure uh, a lot of people will have seen uh, that it's not quite what they said it was. Um, the people who were having any sort of an issue with whatever it was that were going on had so many other comorbidities. As Ben says, this is the real pandemic. We want to be able to show you how to not have those uh, comorbidities so that if anything anything happens like that again, which it probably has every year at the time of seasonal detoxes, to be honest, then you're not going to have any trouble with this. You're going to be strong and your uh, body will be able to fight off anything that comes along wherever it came from. The answer to this is is not to follow any of the dietary guidelines that come from the same people who are pushing all of the chemicals and um, fake foods on you. This is not as, the answer. Absolutely, as we're about to see. And we, and we we do want you guys to know that although this message might seem very dark, there is a very simple solution to all of this. We're going to show you how the, let's call them the powers that shouldn't be, how they're perpetrating this this great crime against humanity we'll show you how it works we'll show you how to protect yourself um how to protect your own health your family's health and everything else and the solution is actually very simple but as we said you're not going to hear about it via the mainstream as you will see so let's let's just dive in what's going on in the world today okay this is simply the percentage of um people suffering from chronic diseases in america so how do we define chronic diseases how can you understand what chronic diseases are and why this is quite a novel a novel thing so what are we what are we talking about phil we're talking about things like type 2 diabetes cancers heart yeah. disease this is stuff that that takes time to creep into your life and takes time to kill you it doesn't just kill you like 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 an infection right yeah, well, and, and autoimmunity. I mean, everybody throws all, hundreds and hundreds of different illnesses. I mean, they, they find a new one every year, these autoimmune issues. And um, this is stuff that we didn't have in the past. Nobody had ever heard of it. And the indigenous tribes don't have it. But yeah. heart disease is the major one that everybody's talking about. Yeah, which which we'll come on to. So, I mean, these have also been called called diseases of civilization for that reason, because the people who are just living out there on the earth don't seem to suffer from it. But just looking at this, from 1940, 8-9% of people suffering with, with uh, chronic disease, and now it's over 60%. Okay, so something is seriously going wrong. Whatever they are doing, it's not working to the benefit of your health. Now, this has been going on an awful long time. This statue is from about four, four and a half thousand years ago. And uh, this, is a, this is a man. This is from ancient Egypt. Now, the interesting thing about ancient Egypt, we won't go into too much detail right now, but this is the longest surviving agricultural empire. All the other ones destroyed their soil through the use of the plow. Again, we'll come on to that in a bit. But the ancient Egyptians were very lucky because they got fresh soil washed down from the Ethiopian plateau that then fertilized the, the Nile Delta every year. So there, the pharaonic civilization actually went on for two and a half thousand years. They were expert agriculturalists. They grew lots of grains. They pressed uh, oils from lots of seeds. They brewed beer. They baked bread and kind of stuff. And they got man boobs. And we also, as, as you can see, there's a clear signs of gynecomastia here. This, this, this rich male, this is actually an Egyptian prince who they think may have been the architect of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Clearly, he's he's got gynecomastia. He's got very rounded kind of figure. Um, and we also know that from analysing Egyptian mummies is that they they showed evidence of cardiovascular disease. And this was two and a half thousand years before Christ. But what's interesting is that um, that kind of disappeared. The, the the Egyptians invented chronic disease and then it disappeared. So this comes from a this is a survey of the cause of death of 
everybody in the town of Boston, Massachusetts in 1811. So going back just over 200 years. And we'll just point out a few things in here. Cancer, five. Out of 942 people, cancer were only five. And there's no record of heart attacks at all. So did we not know what a heart attack was? Well, no, we, we kind of did. I mean, the ancient Egyptians knew about They wrote about the symptoms of an, uh, a heart attack that was about to happen. They knew about it. This is disease of the heart. So basically heart disease and the history in the United States per 100,000 people. And we just want to draw your attention to this, this ring here. Around 1920, between 1910 and 1920, something happened. We'll come back to that in a second. Diabetes, right? In the 50s, almost nobody had diabetes. And now it's over 20% of the, no, it's not. It's over about 7% of the population suffering from diabetes, right? Gone from you know, one to seven in just a couple of generations. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, in, in a long time ago, it was known as sugar diabetes, and they pretty much nailed it. And then they dropped that off the front that, so they could pretend that they don't know why you get it and you need a load of medication. But it's really very simple. Yeah. And here again, look, it, it grew pretty steadily and pretty scarily until the late 90s. And then it's suddenly doubled in rate as well of growth. So isn't that all interesting? Now, this is cancer deaths per 100,000 in the United States. 1900, you're talking about 50, 60 people in 1900. Now it's going over 200. We're being told that one in two men in the US should expect to get cancer in their lifetimes now, and one in three women. One in two if you were born after 1960, across the board, okay? Scary stuff. And again, it's just grown and grown and grown. Our health is collapsing. And it, this is all related to obesity. We're not saying obesity causes this thing, but you know, if, if you're carrying those extra pounds, it's a sign that you are in the grip of this, all right? Here's obesity. And again, it grew throughout the 20th century, but then around 1980, suddenly doubled in rate as well. Like we say, guys, this is the end game. So what potentially could be causing this absolute collapse in health? Well, here's one idea. What happened in 1980 in the United States? Well, the first major US dietary guidelines for Americans were released and they told you eat a variety of foods, main, maintain ideal weight, which they say basically eat less, move more, avoid too much fat, saturated fat and cholesterol. We'll get onto that a bit more. Eat foods with adequate starch and fiber, very important. Avoid too much sugar, sodium, and you can have a little bit of alcohol, okay? So, and then suddenly up goes the obesity rate. Do you know a good a good exercise for anyone watching this to, to il illustrate that is to just go and Google people on the beach in the 1960s or 70s and then Google it now. Yeah. Just just you go see the difference. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we didn't used to be fat only a couple of generations ago. Okay. And so here is the, the diabetes graph again. We can see this big change around the late 90s. What happened there? Well, guess what? In 1995, the dietary guidelines for Americans were updated. and But also this was the first time when they were mandated by statute. Okay, it could be a coincidence. We don't know. Okay, but uh, suddenly diabetes became a lot more fashionable from that point. So here again, heart disease. So heart disease was was not very common up until about 1920, and then has shot up throughout the rest of the 20th century. Okay, what could have happened there? Well, we've got Procter and Gamble to thank for that. 1911, they brought their Crisco vegetable-based shortening onto the market. Now, before this point, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, Americans were getting about 99% of their calories from additional fats from fats from animals. So lard, tallow, butter, that kind of thing. Phil, let's, let's just mention briefly the history of, of the seed oils because they'd been obviously growing a lot of cotton in the United States and they had a lot of cotton seed left over, which was a bit of a, a pain. So they started to press the seeds and to get an oil out of the seeds, but they weren't originally used for foods, were they? No, well, it was, uh, you know, it was um, uh, detergent, wasn't it? <laughs> it was 
soap making additives, but also as engine lubricant, you know, machinery lubricant. So, and this suddenly has become something that we're supposed to think is heart healthy. And it was introduced just before the time when the, the heart disease shot up. So do you think, do, do we think that it was the lard and the tallow and the butter? A, you know, we've eaten them forever. Ancient foods do not cause modern diseases. Yeah. So Procter & Gamble uh, brought out a, a recipe book that they gave out for free to housewives all across America. And then a few years later, heart disease started to go through the roof. And we'll come back to that again. All right. Next up, here is the animal fat consumption in the US. You can see a kind of a, a pattern here. Um, Americans were having quite a few pounds per year per person. It, it dropped down dramatically in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, sugar, on the other hand, went up dramatically. And of course, vegetable oil consumption went from practically nil at the turn of the 20th century to grow and grow and grow. And then again, the 1950s and 60s, it jumped up dramatically once more. And we were we will explain why in a minute. So what we really want you guys to understand is that it's this change in how we fuel our bodies that is linked so powerfully to the explosion in chronic disease. So try and think of it as like a misfueling. If you put diesel in a gasoline car, a petrol car, your engine is going to conk out. And then the mechanic is going to say, well, what did you do? And say, oh, I put the wrong fuel in. Well, exactly the same thing is going to happen to your body, right? We have switched from getting most of our fuel from relatively natural foods, from uh, animal fats, from dairy, and and some then from from grains and other agricultural products to getting a lot more from seed oils, from cotton seed, uh, rape seed, which is canola, uh, sunflower, safflower, soybean oil. Now the the most popular in the U.S. and these things are basically toxic. They are repurposed. Um, industrial lubricants that we have been told that we can eat. So next question, why on earth would anybody allow this to happen? Right? Good question. And there are really three probable reasons. Here is an example of a triangle or pyramid. We're going to see a couple more of those as we go along. Okay. Number one, fake food is insanely profitable. So about two thirds of what Americans eat today is what you might term hyper-processed food or ultra-processed food, which basically comes from five main ingredients. They are corn, soy, wheat, sugar, and seed oils, right? And the products that people make out of these are hugely profitable for a few reasons. One is that the basic ingredients are super, super cheap. And so what they do is they, they get these different ingredients and they recombine them in factories in novel forms, right? These these aren't real foods. None of the, these things that you're seeing here are real foods. You wouldn't find these anywhere in nature, right? And they like crinkly potato chips and Skittles and Oreos and, and whatever. So these things are churned out of factories. They all look exactly the same. And the point is that a company, you can you can you can't patent anything in nature, right? You can't patent a, a like an ancient breed of cow or pig or, or or a natural plant that grows you have to change it you have to make it your own you have to gene genetically modify it or in the case of food you create something brand new so if you create like skittles or or pringles then you can own the design of that but it has to be literally artificial you have to have created it yourself and that means that all the money that you plow into the marketing for that, you get all the returns for that. And like we say, this is extremely cheap stuff. All of these things come from row crops. And can and, I just yeah. jump in there as well? Because they also, we'll come on to that later, but they also have another layer to catch you, which I'll just point out at this stage briefly, which is then if you get ill, you must eat far more fruits and veggies. <laughs> and basically that is just an unprocessed version of the poisons that they're creating you know that they're using to create these complete franken foods but we'll come on to that maybe a bit later i'll let you go yeah. on with this yeah one. well i mean we don't have time right now to go into what's wrong with modern fruits and modern vegetables as well but there is a lot more to be said about that okay so i mean th this is how these so-called foods 
This is where they come from, right? They come from giant machines working giant fields. And can you see any sign of life there? Right? It may even be that these combines here are actually driven by robots and guided by GPS, and there's no human beings even in this picture at all. And so they create this fake stuff. But then they put words on it, healthy, healthy choice. You can put that on whatever you like. Natural. What's this? Peanut butter spread with honey, creamy, right? Farm fresh. Chocolate milk with sugar in it, okay? So So where where does this come from? Chocolate cows or something? Yeah. How how come this is natural? Brilliant. Yeah, come from brown cows, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the first way that, that there's money in fake food. There is a lot less money in natural food and good food that comes straight from nature. The second area, of course, fake medicine. And we don't have time to go into this in, in great detail, but um, there's a lot of money in in pharmaceuticals, okay? Just look at this, for example. The entire US beef market is worth about 60-something billion dollars per year. The, the whole, the entirety of agriculture in the United States is worth less than 200 billion per year. Pfizer alone made sales in excess of $100 billion in 2022. So Pfizer, just the number one pharmaceutical company, has sales that are more than half of all the agriculture in the US. Okay, so there's an awful lot of money in this. You add up all the top, just the top 10 pharmaceutical companies in the world, and this is global, by the way, but so $600 billion per year. It is huge, huge business. Just to make people clear, when they're looking at that, This is extraordinary profits that they're making. And these pharmaceuticals have never once cured a chronic disease. If you get very lucky, they might bring the symptoms down and blow up some other part of your body. But clearly, this is not the way. And this is the way that people are being led because they don't know the ancestral secrets of how to stay healthy, which we go through in huge detail in the Big Fat Challenge. But for now, just, just be aware that these profits are made from failing to actually fix any chronic disease. Yeah, and just like the food, what they've done is they've told us that the the natural version of, of health and how to stay healthy isn't good enough. What you need is products. You need something in a packet that you go and pick off a shelf and buy. And that's where all the money comes from. And who do we have to thank for this model? The saintly John D. Rockefeller. Um, we're not going to go into much detail on this but basically john john rockefeller got hit with a an antitrust lawsuit in the 20th century and then he plowed all of his money into the rockefeller foundation that then bought its way onto the boards of every medical school in the united states um and then bought control over that med- medical school the, the the entire medical education system so that he could then force through that every doctor who was licensed to practice in the United States had to come from his system that that promoted pharmaceutical drugs. And basically every kind of naturopath or natural health practitioner was then out in the cold. They were were kind of exiled from that point on. They couldn't really practice. So fake food, fake medicine, and there's a third one, right? Which is the fact that another reason why that why they this may benefit the powers that shouldn't be that slave food increases their control, right? They have all the owners of slaves have always given their slaves the cheapest carb heavy gruel, right? Through for thousands and thousands of years. Now, when you and you you, you can learn this for yourself if you are addicted to carbohydrates, if you're getting basing most of your meals on carbohydrates, which is what we're told to do, then you will find that you get hungry all the time, right? You get hungry quicker. You have to keep eating meals. You have to keep putting food in your face, right? So that makes people easier to control when they are addicted and dependent on a constant supply of carbs. When you fuel your body on its preferred fuel, which is the the manufacturer's recommended fuel, animal fats, fats from the animal kingdom, then you will realize that you simply don't need to eat as frequently, as often. You can go much further between meals, and that's just a few of the benefits. And to be honest, we really just should start to see things like wheat and sugar as what they are, which is recreational drugs, not true foods, because they don't nourish your body and they don't satisfy. Um, Absolutely. And at the... the, 
if you if you just look at what the, the people who are pushing these kind of grains and seed oils and plant-based diets of all sorts, you actually look at what they, I mean, look at the menu in the Davos sort of meetings and whatever. And you can see that they've all got this, this beef and game and fatty meat. And they've always eaten like that. We actually know somebody who grew up in the same town as Bill Gates, and he's pushing all the plant-based stuff and fake meats and whatever. Always used to see him in the local steakhouse. Now, he looks a little bit like that uh, that Egyptian that you pulled up earlier on. So he's obviously eating some rubbish with it as well. Yeah. But these people know what's healthy. They've always eaten it, and then they've fed the slaves the uh, the diet that we're supposed to eat now, rich in fiber and uh, all that sort of nonsense. Yeah. yeah, they always knew. They know now. Got to have your whole grains. It's good for your heart and stuff like that. And yeah. then, then we get propaganda like this. We're going to talk a lot more about, about propaganda uh, coming up as well. Uh, the game changers thing was tried to claim that well the Roman gladiators were, were they were known as horde arii which means barley eaters right and the 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 premise in in the game changers movie was that uh, these were the elite athletes of their day they weren't elite athletes they were slaves with a very very short shelf life they weren't expected to live very long so they they fed them on the cheapest stuff slaves have always been fed on cheap carbs. Yeah, and the more the, the the fatter the slaves are, the more the more sword cuts they can take, and so the longer they'll make some money for their owners. And if anybody has has been taken in by any of these vegan propaganda films, please go and look up some debunks of the game changers. Just put that into into YouTube. You'll find a long, long sections on that of exactly how nonsensical every single aspect of that film is. Yeah, and of course one other. A uh, key area that helps to make people easier to control is that your brain needs a lot of good fats. It needs long chain fatty acids and it needs cholesterol in order to function properly. There was a study actually came out in 2011 and then a post hoc analysis of the uh, the data from that study. The study was actually to do with vitamin B12, but um, what they did was that they they looked at the diets of a, a large number of elderly people. And they also scanned their brains to estimate the sizes of their brains and looked at and, and tracked them over, over a few years. And what was interesting in that is that out of that population, the, the subjects who completely abstained from animal products, i.e. what we would call vegans or plant-based, every single one of them at the start of the study had a smaller capacity brain than every single one of the omnivore subjects in the study plus the vegans brains deteriorated quicker they actually lost one percent of their brain size every year of the study so it simply makes your brain smaller and when your when your brain doesn't work right again makes you easier to control because you can't really think for yourself right so let's move on to how they did it oh look it's another pyramid film right how did they do it well this is the current uh, U.S. dietary guidelines, and we're, we're focusing on the U.S. here, but the same could apply to any Western country, and of course, increasingly to the so-called developing world as well. Um, where does the where do the dietary guidelines come from now? Uh, if you want to learn more about this, then get Denise Minger's book, food, uh, "Death by Food Pyramid." It's fantastic. Um, the, for, so, for the, the the latest round of of guidelines. There was an analysis. 95% of the members on the expert committee that recommended these guidelines had conflicts of interest with the food or pharmaceutical industries. What on earth have the pharmaceutical companies got to be, you know, what interest have they got in what we eat? Who knows? Um, 700 pretty, conflicts pretty of interest. Much, pretty much everything, actually, but yeah. we're going to show that. They're all the yeah. same, all the part of the same wheel, little spokes in the same wheel. Yeah, they are. And, and the corporations, Kellogg, Abbott, Kraft, Meat Johnson, General Mills, and Danon had the most frequent connections to the committee, right? So basically, you're, you're, what you are told to eat, the education that you're getting about what is healthy, comes from corporations who sell processed junk food, right? It is not there for your health, simple fact. Uh, another obvious thing, uh, because this, this hyper-processed food is so damn profitable, then these corporations get to plow their money back into marketing. So the majority of what you see out there on the billboards, on the TVs, it comes from the companies who make the most money because they can afford to market better to you. 
Um, we <laughs> we won't talk too much about this guy. Ansel Keys, possibly responsible for more human death than any other individual in history, I would say. Um, he came up with a, a hypothesis in the 1950s after President Eisenhower had the first of his heart attacks. And Keyes had this idea that it was uh, saturated fat and cholesterol in our diets that caused heart disease. Keyes was actually, and this, this is a, a statement of fact, he was bankrolled by the sugar industry. Uh, also, the American Heart Association, Heart Association was bankrolled by Procter and Gamble, the creators of Crisco. Um, Keyes's hypothesis was never proven. In fact, it's been disproven time and time and time again. And yet, we all still know saturated fat clogs your arteries. Meat will give you cancer, heart disease, stuff like that. Right? It's all nonsense. The evidence isn't actually there, but the cultural narrative still carries on this fantasy that Keyes came up with in the 1950s. The dude actually lived for 100 years because after he retired, he went and then he moved to Italy, somewhere like that. Well, did. I, I think what happened was that, you know, his seven countries study or whatever he did, because he kicked out all of the... Oh, I've um, got this, yeah. Yeah, he kicked out all of the inconvenient data, didn't he, of, of the countries that ate loads of fat and they were fine. Um, but what what happened was, I think, I think the worst thing about Keyes was that he knew... He knew what he was doing and did it for the money because he went off, lived in Italy, lived, you know, if he goes and lives there, he's not going to be living on, on, on sort of low fat stuff. He's going to be eating sort of high fat sausages. He's going to be eating fish. He's going to be eating meat. And he, he lived in a place where he knew people lived a long time and they ate the proper food and he lived to a hundred years old. Man was yeah. a criminal. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, religion has also played a part in, uh, I mean, maybe these people are useful idiots, I don't know. So um, who have we got in this picture? On the left, we have Miss Ellen G. White. Phil, can you uh Yeah, I've done, we're, through, we're through this story very quickly, but it, it is a fascinating story and worth going into because it, it illustrates how sort of re weird subsets of, of culture and, and religion and spirituality and that kind of thing have affected our, our dietary choices. Ellen G. White in the 1800s, she was a young girl at the time, had these visions, whether she had them or not, who knows, that we should all eat a Garden of Eden diet, which was all plant-based and grains and all that kind of thing, because it removed sexual desire, which was so evil. Now, Obviously, it, re it, it removes sexual desire if, if by the, the, the method of, uh, of messing up our hormones. But anyway, she pushed this. The family ended up um, adopting a young boy to help with the typesetting of the pamphlets and all the nonsense that she was putting out. And he got That's pretty the, the gentleman in the middle. Yep, yep. He grew up and to, to own sort of cereal companies in the Midwest. And his name was Harvey Kellogg. And... It, it is it's ridiculous to see where this has come from, because Harvey Keller was an absolute lunatic. He had all sorts of bizarre ideas, including, you know, circumcision of ma males and females, you know, to keep them away from sexual desire. They all had this thing to get rid of sexual desire. So all of our plant based um, um, ideologies or many of them in the West come through the uh, Seventh Day Adventists. And this is what these people are part of. And and, you know, we we often joke that you know Harvey Kellogg created the anti masturbation cornflakes, but really, when you look down the cereal aisle, when you know how this sort of nonsense came about, all that stuff that isn't human food that's pretend they pretend to be healthy now, that came from the visions of a teenage girl in the eighteen hundreds. So now, do we trust the dietary guidelines? Yeah, and then the lady on on the the right of your picture is Lena F. Cooper. She was also a devotee of the Seventh Day Adventist Church and happened to go on to found the American Dietetic Association, which is, if you're a registered dietitian in the US, that's where you get your qualification from. Obviously, she was also a devoted vegetarian. The Seventh-day Adventist Church also owns the Sanitarium Company, the largest grain producer in all of Australasia. Go and check out their website, sanitarium.au, and check out their healthy nutrition advice and plant-powered recipes. Go and knock yourself out there. And if you find that you're you're too inclined to sexual desire, then eat some of this stuff that they are telling you. A little bit more about these guys. They now renamed, I think 2012, they renamed to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. 
And a lot of um, plant-based advocates will tell you they'll recite this. It's the position of the academy that appropriately planned vegetarian, including be- vegan diets are healthful at any time of life and so on and so forth. Wikipedia has the following to say about the academy. It's funded by a number of food multinationals, pharmaceutical companies, stop me if you've heard this before, and food industry lobbying groups such as the National Confectioners Association. The Academy has faced controversy regarding corporate influence related to its relationship with the food industry and funding from corporate groups such as McDonald's, Coca-Cola and Mars. Right. And these people are saying that you should eat, you know, all all of this kind of stuff and your plant based diet is healthy for all ages. And it absolutely isn't. And so why are so many people now being prosecuted? all around the world for bringing up their kids on a vegan diet and really, really mal malnourishing them or even killing them. Yeah. So, you know, this, this is, this is pretty much genocidal misinformation, I would say from these, these corporations. And it it permeates throughout the cultural narrative as well. We all know five a day, got to get you five a day. Where did this come from? A marketing brainstorm in the 1990s, right. With, uh, I think U.S. Fruit and Vegetable Grocers Association. Um, And of course, the other one, the balanced diet. We'll come back to a balanced diet in a minute. You might have heard Eat the Rainbow as well. Quite honestly, you'd be better off eating Skittles than uh, eating all the fruit and veg. You know, I'm going to say one quick thing on that, and and that is that, you know, this five a day thing. At one point, they tried to increase it to, wasn't it, seven or ten a day? And I have a dentist friend who said to me, well, I'm going to be busy. You know, there there were no cavities among the among the indigenous tribes who ate largely meat, particularly among the Inuit. You dig up the skulls, they have no cavities, nothing like that. This is another disease of of of, of modern society. And it comes from the overconsumption of plant foods and not just processed plant foods, but other plant foods as well that we eat out of season and inappropriately. Including fruit, which is nature's candy which we would have eaten at some point in our history, but not every single day of the year. And don't ask your doctor. Doctors get almost zero training in nutrition. They get almost zero training in how to prevent disease because they are a product of the Rockefeller system. Okay. Now, how about this guy? This guy ought to know what's best for us. He has our best interest at heart. Mr. Klaus Schwab, president of the World Economic Forum, so you may have come across this uh, this short video that they made where they informed us that in the future, <clears throat> you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. They also tell us in point four of the same video, you'll eat much less meat, an occasional treat, not a staple for the good of the environment and our health. Now, <laughs> excuse me, we do not have time to go into the whole environmental side at all on this or the ethical side, but we go into that in great detail on the Big Fat Challenge and in our book, the red pill food revolution as well. Now, just just ask yourself, right? And like, like we say, if you have woken up to the lies that the WEF, the United Nations, the World Health Organization and stuff are telling you over and over again, Mr. Gates, you know who they are, right? They lie about everything else. Why on earth would they be telling the truth about food? Why would they be telling the truth when they tell us that we're going to be eating bugs, lab-grown meat, all of that kind of stuff, okay? Just leaving this out there. Or could it be more insidious, right? Why would they be telling the truth about this? And even worse, could, could this be about more than your health? Could this be more than just controlling us, more about more than just about getting more money from us? Could there... Could it even extend to talking about like the soul of humanity? So we we actually think that they, depending on your point of view, there could very much be a spiritual aspect to to all of this. Um, I mean, Phil, you were drawn to plant based diets through the religious path yourself in the in the first place, as a lot of people have, right? Yeah, well, you know, there's all this this idea that you're not going to get enlightened if you eat meat. You're not going to ascend to five D or all, all, all of this kind of nonsense. And this is all part of the control mechanism. And I fell for it for a long time. And as you've said, Ben, in the past, I think it's incredibly disrespectful to all our yeah. ancestors. Yeah, most of them, most of them ate meat. Well, they they all ate meat, but most of them ate la- almost exclusively meat, as yeah. particularly at certain times of year. And these people were very, very healthy. They were very, very deeply spiritual 
And the idea that it brings down your vibration and all of that, it's nonsense. We are facultative carnivores. This is our digestive system. We are not herbivores. We can take a little bit of plants now and again, nowhere near as many as we do now. But if you look back in the history at the really strong, very spiritual, totally balanced, in line with nature, all of these kind of uh, cultures, they did not eat anything that Ellen G. White or Harvey Kellogg would recommend. Yeah. And they managed to procreate as well, clearly, because we're all here. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, literally, if, if, if you've been sucked into the plant-based dogma and and uh, and propaganda you know could could you look your a thousand fathers a thousand mothers could you look them in the eye and say actually because i'm 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 vegan now i'm more spiritually evolved than you i mean what an insult to all of your ancestors seriously guys um and the bottom line is there is no way of eating that avoids death but the point is that avoidance of death is not is not what it's about because life and death are two sides of the same coin. We talk about this uh, uh, length in, in our book and on, and on the course as well. It, the only way to avoid death really is to avoid life, right? Because death, for every life, there is always one death. So if you want to minimize death, you need to minimize life. So the opposite of life is actually lifelessness. The opposite of life is this. This is where the majority of what people in the West are eating, this is where it comes from, right? It comes from machines. It comes from treating Mother Earth like a resource to be mined, okay? This is, this is the opposite of life, okay? This is not where you're going to get your health. So what is the solution? And you, you gave me this idea, Phil. This is, you know, all you had to do was look at the first, first recorded evidence of, of you know, what did we choose to, to make pictures about Cave paintings. See how humans are designed to eat, right? The, the way that we are supposed to eat is the is the way that humans have always eaten. And what have we always eaten? Animals, right? It's it's there on record. So yeah, there's there's, there's no no broccoli in a cave painting. Never no, seen not, it. Absolutely. So what is a real balanced diet? Well, if you really think about it, it's not that you should have some grains and some soda and the occasional sugar-coated donut, right? A balanced diet really is, if you're going to redefine it, you want to put everything into your body that your body needs and as little as possible of the toxins that it doesn't need. And that just means switching back your macronutrients, right? Increase the animal fats, which do not clog your arteries, which do not cause coronary heart disease, because it didn't used to exist when that's what we used to eat, right? Cut out the sugar, cut out the excess fruit fruit and veg, cut out the grains, right? And particularly cutting out those horrible fake industrial seed oils. Yeah, and I've, you know, I, it's it's very hard for people to accept that, to say that, you know, it, it's we should eat more meat and because it's, it's, it's said that it's caused, causing heart disease, cancer, all of these sort of things. Well, I've eaten absolutely nothing but meat for eight years and I'm still here, I'm 61, I'm, I'm okay. And, you know, a hell of a lot leaner and uh, feeling better than I did about 15 years ago. Now, we I've been working with people with diets for 40 odd years, you know, in various capacities. I've never seen anything like the healing that happens on a fully carnivore diet. That's not to say that we're saying everybody should do that. But it just goes to show that there is nothing wrong with me. And this is not a few people here and there where you say useless anecdotes. Mm -hmm. The carnivore movement is now huge. The healing is incredible. Look it up. Look some of the carnivore docs <laughs> up. Look, so look at, join some of the Facebook groups, whatever. Mine is called 100% Carnivore and Beyond. And the healing we see in there is incredible, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, you know, yeah. if, if there was anything wrong with meat, we wouldn't see this kind of thing. And it's long-term healing. We understand there's, there's healing on plant-based diets because it's a little bit of a, a fast. And so that can help, you know, initially. And if you cut out the processed then, stuff, then you, yeah. you'll get benefit from it. Yeah, you will. But then in the long term, other plant toxins come up. We, I would love to have the time to go into plant toxins in detail here. But and we're talking about plant toxins and enormous amounts of toxins, even in organic green veg, yeah. which the yeah. sort of thing that didn't exist 200 years ago and, and our ancestors never ate. We could. But on the Big Fat Challenge, we'll go deeply into that, show you about that. But, um, yeah, if, there, if, if, if there was anything harmful about meat, 
people would not be curing everything that meat is supposed to be to it's supposed to be causing by eating nothing but meat and there are hundreds of thousands and, of them and, and fat of course and fat the fat, fat is, really is, the is the thing you know it, even mm -hmm. the meat we get is the fat's all trimmed off we need fats we don't need carbohydrates we need fats for energy that's yeah. what the big fat challenge is about on the basic level of the dietary thing just getting people understanding about fats and fueling themselves properly not yeah. with the, the 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 nonsense byproducts of uh of of agriculture so row crop farming you know absolutely so like we said there is a solution the solution is relatively simple but in order to turn this around to take back control of your health you need to retrain your thinking and you need to retrain your habits and maybe accept the very very strong likelihood that you are chemically addicted to things like wheat and sugar already possibly alcohol as well um you've been fed shit quite honestly your whole life not only in your mouth but i hope we've given you a hint that in your ears as well right what you've been told is bs for for your whole life and you you need to look at food and go treat food in a similar way to you treat other things and say well okay i'm not i'm not automatically going to accept that what the authorities what the orthodox line is telling me is the truth um but like we say don't believe us but here's some more examples right um and now the the these are not necessarily people that that we know not necessarily people in our group okay but just some examples these are people who've who've switched out the the grains and the carbs and the seed oils for meat they get changes like this, okay? That's 12 weeks, right? This is me. This is me when we did our, our first 90-day challenge, right? That's a start. A few weeks later, super lean, right? I'm not going down the gym, none of this. Look at this lady, right? Again, just a few weeks. Look at the difference. Look at her. This dude. What about that? That's insane, right? We could just keep on and on and on. Okay, there are so many examples. This guy was fruitarian. He gained 30 kilos. So this is the point. Phil, it's not a weight loss diet, right? No, it's a, it's a weight optimization diet. And and sometimes, you know, you won't um you 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 won't actually see a difference on the scale so much because you're increasing muscle mass and bone density at the same time as you're you're getting rid of the fat. So you're you're changing your body composition around. But just on this on this vegan here, this is I uh, you know, a we do not vegan bash. I mean, I've been vegan. I've suffered the consequences of it. I've had the kidney stones. I've had the emaciation. But if you look at the picture of him on the left, you can see the whole collagen thing. The eyes get sunken in. The yeah. the um, the the eyelids. You can see they just tend to go back into the head. This is very very common. His, his, bo uh, his body is cannibalizing itself to get the fats that his brain desperately needs in order to function. It, it, it is. And, and, and the more that they go into it, the more that they decide that the symptoms are all detox. And we've got to go through Even when the teeth start falling out, they say, well, this is detox. You know, the weirdest things happen. And, and they say that uh, uh, the, the, I've heard the vegan women say, well, you know, periods, having having your monthly cycle is just a, a sign that you are toxic. And so when that disappears, mm. then then you're getting more pure. Yeah. And that 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 vegan men should ejaculate fresh water. Yeah. If, if they ejaculate yeah. semen, then there's something wrong. So this again is is coming from the whole myth of that there's something wrong with our natural robust sexuality. That is the reason why vegans are here in the first place, because their parents were healthy enough to breed. There's yeah. never been multi-generational vegan cultures. They 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 would they would be they would be sterile. And that is part of the whole eugenics program of the people like um, like uh, uh, Klaus Schwab and everything else. Anything that's going to make us sick or sterile, they're well up for. So this is why they're pushing these plant based diets. The more plants you eat and the less fatty meat you eat, the more likely you're going to have to falling foul of this this kind of thing. Absolutely. And like we say, guys, do not believe a word we're saying, right? The, the whole reason that we're in this mess is we've believed authority figures in the past. We do not want you to believe us. If you wish, you can go and check the facts for yourself. The facts are all out there. The information is, is all there to be found if you want to do it. But what we are asking you to do is to experience the transformation 
for yourself. There is no better way to understand something than to try it out for yourself, okay? So what we would recommend is take 90 days, cut out at the very least the, the anything anything the hyper-processed food, all the seed oils, because the seed oils is in most of that garbage, right? Processed sugar, processed grains, all of that stuff, and replace those fuel sources with your manufacturers, whether you believe we were created by God, by Darwinian evolution or aliens, I don't care. But the manufacturer's recommended fuel for your human body is animal fats, right? Try it for 90 days, you will experience a transformation, okay? Now, we must also say there are some challenges and pitfalls along the way. So we, we said that the solution was simple. We didn't necessarily say it was going to be easy. Let us give you a few a few warnings for along the way. Um, Phil, the, the addiction to sugar and carbs is is very, very real. It is. It's and, right and, up there with, with tobacco and heroin, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Beyond, I should think. But but the problem is we have in, in the modern day, we have done a, a, a very, a very silly thing, which is combine carbohydrates with fats. So if you look at any really addictive food, whether it's ice cream, pizza, chips, crisps, as we call them in England, or fries or all of this sort of thing, it's a combination of carbohydrates and fats, whether it's sweet or whether it's savory. That is the addictive food and nature doesn't make it except in breast milk when small babies are supposed to grow and then occasionally in nuts and whatever around the autumn time to put on fat for the winter. That's how it was designed. But it's nothing like the level of, of mixed carbohydrates and fats that we take in nowadays. Now, it, it's bad enough if you have the natural fats and carbohydrates and mix them up. But nowadays, our carbohydrates are generally these processed grains plus seed oils. And if you look at anything, it's sort of maize, starch, because Ben mentioned these, these, these sort of crispy, crunchy things that we, uh, we, we crave a lot. And it's cooked in seed oils. So all the time we're taking in this combination. That's extremely dangerous. And it's very, very addictive. And it stays in your, in, in your, in, in your brain, you know, whether it's a, a physical or a mental addiction. Now, in the Big Fat Challenge, we have several ways around this. Everything from the practical to the emotional to, you know, EFT and, and uh, the tapping thing. Everything we have in here um, to help you through these pitfalls. The addiction thing is, is, is very real. However, as the body readjusts, the body becomes fat adapted to, to run on fats. The microbiome readjusts, which we don't go into particularly because nobody understands it. And if anybody says they do, they're lying. It's too complicated. But as that rearranges, then these things tend, these cravings tend to die down a, an awful lot. But there are pitfalls in the, in the short term that we can help you with. There are certain things that happen with electrolyte balance, with your sort of potassium mm -hmm. and uh, magnesium and sodium as the kidneys uh, readjust to, to running on fats and they tend to dump some electrolytes. So there are certain things that happen in the first 30 days that that people experience that are very normal and are very easy to to um, to to to, mit to mitigate. But it makes them turn back and they go, oh, that's that's dangerous. That's no good. So I'll turn back. What we want to give you is absolute confidence, absolute confidence in in, in what's going on and also a clear way of 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 separating bullshit, because the, the confidence in doing it is is what's going to keep you on it and understand the little pitfalls that can happen as your body rearranges after decades of abuse. Now, my best bullshit filter is to relate ancestrally. As we've gone through in this presentation, you can see that in uh, through most of our history, we didn't eat any of this stuff. We didn't do any of this stuff. We didn't have EMFs. You know, we didn't have artificial light. We didn't have stress about mortgages. We didn't have all of this sort of thing that can add up to damaging our mitochondria the energy the little motors in the cells and that always leads to chronic disease in the long term and if you've got that our vision is to teach you how to take care of the mitochondria it's actually very simple it's nothing difficult it doesn't take up any of your time in the day really just a little few minutes here and there to change your to change your thinking but what's needed is an enormous amount of deprogramming and 
you know, in the challenge, we have every aspect of that, of deprogram deprogramming you from every aspect of what you've been told in the past and to give you confidence to go on and do this. Because I, I started doing this somewhere around the early 90s. I kind of half figured it out. But then I was still caught up in too many misconceptions. So I stopped it. I turned back. You know, I do it for like a couple of weeks, feel great, lose fat, all sorts of things would happen. But then I thought, I need to now get back onto my healthy diet. I need my fiber. I need my grains. Mm. I need my healthy fruit and veg. And then I'd start to feel bad again. However, I still did it. I still kept going back to it. And to give you the, if I'd done that, I'd never have run into any of the issues I did sort of 10, 15 years later. And we can we can help you through that that transition period and it's a lot of fun too you know on the challenge we are, well you talk about that ben well but... there's there's more stuff like <clears throat> there the, there can be detox symptoms as well from cutting out the plants if you cut them out if you cut everything out too too suddenly then you can experience like oxalate dumps and stuff so we're going to all of that you can like phil mentioned the electrolytes you've got also potentially digestive system adjustment as well some people might experience constipation other people might experience you know loose stools and stuff like that all of that stuff is is very manageable and also there's a kind of emotional and social side as well because you you need to if you're going to change change your habits if you're living in a family you're living you're, you're working in a workplace right within society changing your thinking and changing the way that you relate to people as well again all all very very important all very very real and all stuff we can help with so i think you know what, what phil was saying just just now is i think we would say that the 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 diet fix the fuel fix if you like is one of the biggest and critical life hacks that you can make but it's only the broad strokes thing. It's not the fine polishing. Like, Phil, this is your analogy that I absolutely love. You've got to hose the mud off the car before you start to polish. And we, so we don't just talk about the food. We talk about the EMFs, grounding, light, you know, and and everything, you know, even down to money and stuff like that. And yeah, how well, to when, you, when, when you come from the pharmaceutical mindset, because we're told to go to the doctor and then you get a pill for a particular illness. This never works, of course, but then we think, right, we're going to go natural. So you go to your health food shop and stock up on tons of, of supplements or, or you go and get some herbal remedy or you go to a naturopath. Some some of their information is is, is quite good. But so it's but it's all adding are, things. You're looking for things to add in, right? We're looking for things to add in. And I've done that. We've all got cupboards full of supplements that we've ended up throwing away when the sell by date come when, the you know, use by date is expired. Now. There are certain broad strokes to health, really broad strokes. And it's probably about sort of five or six major pillars of, of health. And once you understand those, you can generally throw, well, you can throw away all the pharmaceuticals, but you can generally throw away 99% of all those little things that you've been buying, all those supplements, the, the minerals and, the, and, the, and the, the, the sort of uh, vitamins and all these sort of things, synthetic, more synthetic crap. Some of it, I believe, probably made by the pharmaceutical industry to catch people who are just slipping through the net because that stuff doesn't work either. Very, very rarely does it ever work. You need your nutrition from food, proper animal food from good animals that have eaten what they're supposed to eat. And when we show you the pillars of that, this, I mean, this challenge for goodness sake, I mean, we, we've got it, we've got it for a pay what you can afford. Yeah. You could have this as a pay what you can afford and you're going to learn how to save money on all the nonsense that you thought was healthy before, all the rubbishy food, all the, the medical bills, all the supplement bills, or at least 99% of the right, Even just on the food, into, I mean, pe people think, yeah. oh, well, meat's really expensive, right? Meat's got more expensive. Actually, you can end up uh, spending less on your grocery bill by eating proper ancestral species appropriate food. So that that... that we cover all of this on the Big Fat Challenge. So what is it? It's it's a 90 day long, 13 week structured program that walks you through all of this stuff week by week and helps you make that transition from a slave food diet that is practically guaranteed. I mean, we saw the trends in, in health, you know, your health will collapse if you keep eating the crap that they tell you to eat, right? Um, will help you to move over to an ancestrally appropriate, species appropriate way of eating 
and in addition, all the other ancestral uh, reconnects and, and fixes and hacks that can help you to realize your true human potential, your power. So what, why 90 days? Why 90 days, Phil? Well, I, I would say you're going to, you know, if you're fairly healthy, if you go to some diet like this for a sort of very high meat diet but not running on carbs, you notice incredible benefits within the first 30 days. Mm -hmm. However, there can be some hiccups there. Um, 90 days is just, it, it's a really good benchmark as well for people who are suffering chronic problems. If you can go strip for 90 days, you will see so many of those uh, of those issues start to clear up in the 90 days. Some of them might completely clear up. You know, diabetes, you can say goodbye to that pretty much in 90 days. If you've got something a little more established, like rheumatoid arthritis might take a little bit longer, but in that time, you're going to see huge benefits. But most of the little readjustments come in the first 30 days. So let's take the next 60 for enjoying the benefits of it. And then at the end of 90 days, just 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 see if if we're not right and that you're experiencing tremendous benefits. Yeah. So yeah, you you work through it week by week. You get your, your members area, get a bunch of videos every week you can go through. Now, if you want to devour all of this in a weekend, great, knock yourself out. So it's up to you. This is your challenge, right? And we don't preach anything here. We don't say you've got to do this, you can't do that. You you you'll get this. We've also got because we ran this at the start of 2023 for 90 days with a a, a great group of people and we recorded all of our daily calls with that group you can watch all of those because there's so much more information in those calls as well but we're also going to be doing i'm going to be doing a live q a every every sunday so when you're on the challenge you can bring whatever questions you've got phil and i will be there we will answer your questions absolutely live uh what else do you get the red pill food revolution oh my goodness this this book changed my life uh, the writing of this. This is uh, the second book that we've collaborated on. Um, and it goes into all the detail, all the detail about the, the entire history of this food conspiracy and how how it's coming to a head now, why it's so critical that we, as individual sovereign humans, seize back control over our health because nobody Nobody's going to step up and give you your health back. You have to reclaim it for yourself. So you can have this. This book isn't even out on the market yet. You can have this at, at the time of recording in early June. Um, you get this as an audio book. You can get it as uh, as an ebook as well. Um, that's all. That's all thrown in. And like that, also, I, you know what? I, I reckon that alone. Anyone watching this, that alone is worth the price of this challenge. And you get all the other stuff as well. But you, this audio book, I mean, the feedback we've had of it so far, you know, pre-publication is amazing. It's, it's changing people's lives. It, it, it woke us up to a lot of other things during the writing of it. Nobody's put a book, book together like this with covering all of these subjects and bended the words, you know, with some help from, from the rest of us, uh, the rest of the authors. And honestly, I, I can say it, how brilliant it is because Ben put the words together and so I don't have to brag too much, but... It's brilliant. No one's written a book this good about the history of food and how we've been fooled. Absolutely. It's fantastic. Go get I, that. That's I, worth I, the price of entry. And aside from that, there's uh, there's actually three more additional courses and books that we provide free with the, the challenge as well, but we haven't got time to go into all of those. And yeah, like Phil said, it's a pay what you can thing. We, we don't want to exclude anybody from having access to this life-changing, life-saving information. And in addition to that, as a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not completely convinced that this is helpful for you, anytime in the first 30 days, you can just click a button, get your money back. And there's not a problem at all. So re really, you've got nothing to lose except extra pounds around your middle, and except the, pros uh, the, the, the prospect of uh, dying longer, you know, with, uh, ill health into into older age. So that's that's really it, guys. I mean, we've we've communicated as much as we can squeeze into an hour. All we can do is invite you to take a leap of faith, try it, see what works for yourself, take control, test, find out. Because it's it's completely it utterly turned my life around uh, to work with Phil for the last few years and to help so many other people as well figure this out for themselves. Yeah, and I think I think once you've watched a lot of the videos on the Big Fat Challenge, you'll see that we have great fun in the groups. 
you know, and it, it, these people that you can see uh, as as the the weeks progress, their um, their their improvements in health, the weight loss that's happening. Well, let's not call it weight loss; it's fat loss. We don't want to be losing muscle and bone density. We want to be preserving mm-hmm. that. We want to leave leave the general weight loss to the uh, the criminals like um, like Weight Watchers and um, Slimming World, be these people who are set up for repeat business. We're not. We want to set you up to understand how to do this for the rest of your lives and to pass that on to your family and friends and keep them healthy as well but you'll see that we have a lot of fun on the calls and if you want to become involved in the calls beyond just the weekly q a that that we'll do if you want to do that then we also have the big fat tribe do you want to tell them about that ben yeah well you'll find out about that you know on the challenge as well but yeah we we basically came to came to the end of 90 days and we we didn't want to leave this group and we everyone wanted to carry on doing it so we've we've carried on we've got now an ongoing membership as well that you can join and uh and and keep that going but yeah bottom line guys don't believe a thing we we've told you today the information is all out there but you know we just implore you to Test it, try it out for yourself, feel the differences, experience the difference for yourself. You will thank us. Okay. But now, you know, all we can do is thank you for your time. Thanks for watching. And um, yeah, we wish you all the very best. Cool. See you on the, see you on the challenge.